Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see so many. I think, I think there's like almost 60 people already. So it's good to see so many being interested in today's talk. Um, I'm Leonie Fian. I'm part of the environmental psychology group around Sabine Pal, and I'm very happy to introduce you shortly to today's guest. Um, as a start, I'd like to invite you to imagine the following. Pretend someone finds a mistake in one of your published articles. Would you be willing to pay them money? Our guest today is doing just that. If you find an error in his work, he says, thank you and pays you. Gilad Feldman is an assistant professor at the psychology department at the University of Hong Kong. Um, and in his research, in terms of content, he focuses on judgment and decision-making, on choice, morality, and personal values. And methodologically, he has specialized in open science, meta science, and publications. And he advocates a credibility revolution as a response to the replication crisis. And besides encouraging us to go on error hunt in his work, um, Gillette is leading a mass um, pre-registered replication and extension project with around um, 100 replications and extensions of um, social psychology and behavioral economic studies. And currently there are over 60 scholars involved worldwide, including myself, which is how I got in touch with Gillette. And today we're very honored to have him here with us um, yeah, sharing insights into his approach to promoting an open uh, science and on how to make research assessments and replications uh, mainstream. All right, Gilad, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. That was lovely. Um, yeah, so I'm very happy to have the chance to talk to you. I've always wanted the chance to come and get to know all the universities uh, in Austria and collaborate with you. So hopefully uh, through this talk, I'll get to know some of you, you'll get to know me, and maybe this can be the beginning of something wonderful of all of us kind of interacting with one another and doing things and promoting uh, open science. I know from Twitter that a lot of people in this group are very active doing some uh, remarkable things in environmental psychology and promoting open and meta science, which I really care about. Um, so yes, we even have uh, delegates of our early career researcher team uh, in, in Austria, and I can see their names here. So that's wonderful. And I'm very grateful that they joined us and they worked with our students and uh, hopefully good things to come from that in journal submissions and future projects. Uh, so thank you. Today I'll be talking about this uh, pledge, check me, replicate me, but I'll try and do this a little bit more lively in uh, telling you stories. I have a lot of stories to tell. Not all of them are from my own experience, but things that I keep track of and somehow in indirectly they also uh, touch on the things that I do or the team that I work with. So it's important for me to explain where this check me, replicate me pledge and this early career research and, uh, researcher student team, where did this whole thing come from and why am I doing this? Why do I care about this? Um, before I begin, the slides are available for download. Uh, you can scan this or uh, you know, follow this link and then uh, check everything that we have here, share this, use this as you like. There's also lots of hidden slides. And because we have limited time, I will not be able to go over all the slides. So lots of goodies in there with links. So if anything here is interesting to you, please do follow up on that and check those links, uh, some, some good things in there. Uh, later, hopefully we're recording this right now. So I'll upload this to YouTube and the Open Science uh, Framework. Uh, if you wanna see other talks that I give, I, there's a few coming up in Oslo and Bergen and all sorts of other places around the world. So uh, it's very important for me to share everything publicly. So you can go and check things on YouTube on this uh, playlist. So I'll start from this very curious, fun, uh, recent case study. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but for me, this was a... Uh, <clears throat> really uh, interesting and blew, blew my mind. And the case study is uh, a YouTuber um, who is here on the left. 
uh, who does some really nice science blogging. So uh, beyond psychology, talking about uh, physics and uh, biology and all sorts of uh, other things. I first got to know him when he did a bit on open science and is there a replication crisis? Isn't there? But then I subscribed. He has, uh, I can't remember, like 10 million followers or something like that. So a very impactful YouTuber. Uh, you know, I don't know any academic that comes even close to that kind of uh, followership. So um, he, you know, whatever he communicates to audiences has a lot of uh, feedback and response. One of his followers is this professor from UCLA, a physics professor who watched one of his videos and then decided that what the YouTuber uh, talked about actually does not make any sense. And the YouTube video is called a physics professor bet me 10,000 US dollars that I'm wrong. Uh, so he, at some point, you know, they had an exchange, a disagreement, and then the YouTuber told the physics professor, uh, are you willing to put some money behind this? Can we bet $10,000 on this? And the physics professor, of course, you know, it's physics. I know physics. I've been teaching this for a very long time. So nobody's perfect. You know, you make mistakes. I can help you fix this. Let's bet some money. What was this about? It's about this uh, very interesting alleged technology that uh, car that only runs on wind there's no energy source there's no battery there's nothing pushing it but it can maintain speeds that are faster than the wind that's pushing it um, and a physics professor was like i know all the equations i follow all the literature i know that this is impossible so following this public bet they got some science communicators perhaps you're familiar with these faces they're very uh, well known and on tv they communicate science to all ages uh, and they got them to uh, sign on this and here or below you can see the science professor signing this uh, to uh, you know that he's he's willing to pay if he's proven proven wrong now the thing is and i wish we all did this this is to me really inspiring why did the YouTuber, why was he willing to put 10,000 US dollars behind this? Because he says, and I love this, because if I am wrong, then I want to know. You know. The whole purpose of the channel, the YouTube channel, is to get to the truth. The whole purpose of what it is that we do as scientists, psychological scientists, environmental scientists, is to get closer to the truth. Uh, we're not playing some game of who gets to publish more or what impact factors. We do want to uh, ensure that what it is that we communicate is trustworthy and we do want to help society and have something meaningful and impactful that is accurate. Um, so how could it be that the YouTuber actually showed evidence to, for something that actually works and the professor is saying that this is impossible? How can you, there's a paradox over here. What's going on here? Actually, there are YouTube videos showing this effect. So how does the professor explain this? The professor says, well, there's unconscious bias. So sometimes we assume, you know, there's a bias in all sorts of things, questionable research practices, in all sorts of ways. It's not that people are deliberately causing this effect. They really believe that there is an effect, but subconsciously they're creating this effect when in, in reality, there's no effect whatsoever. So watch the, the video and look at this and how we explain this. And he's very certain to the point that he's willing to put 10,000 US dollars. Now, up till here, Sounds great, communication, science, and all that. What is the bottom line for this whole thing? How did this end? The result was the professor was wrong and the YouTuber was right. And it's actually very easy to show this. All you need is a 3D model that you can print if you have a 3D printer and it takes five to 10 US dollars. You don't need 10,000 US dollars to, to check this. And he got another YouTuber that does science stuff and they created a model that now anybody can print and do this by themselves. And at some point the professor says, okay, I'm wrong here, 10,000 US dollars, which the YouTuber used in order to communicate science better and do other projects, which is, I think, just unbelievable. So if you wanna see the video and the proof and the whole thing, uh, go and check that. Now, my takeaways from this, mind blown completely. It's like, what is going on over here? This is a UCLA physics professor against a YouTuber. What is going on over here? And there's so many biases here that just, I don't know how to reconcile this. So the professor at any point in time could have just tried this by himself, but no, he stuck to whatever uh, equations he has or whatever it is that, that he believed in. He assumed bias in others, but he did not 
take a second to check bias within himself, contemplate, maybe I'm biased, maybe something that I'm doing is wrong. And then whenever he saw evidence to support his own theory, he said, okay, this is the thing that you should look at. But whenever he saw things, even a video showing him that he's wrong, he rejected this completely. And this is some of the stuff um, that I try to do research on is researchers uh, judgment, decision-making biases. So I want to study us researchers. If we communicate to others that they're biased, how about checking ourselves first? So we have a bunch of problems like uh, hubris and uh, bias against replications that I meet in almost every rejection letter, a uh, weekly basis almost in the submissions that we have over our replications. He assumes bias in others, but doesn't contemplate his own. That's bias blind spot and then confirmation bias. Uh, Dorothy Bishop has some wonderful videos on that and work that she's done checking these things. Now, my general question to you is, uh, how common is this in science? How often do we put money behind this to the point that we're saying, it's like, forget the bet whether I'm right or wrong. It's like, if I am wrong, then I want to know, do we ever do this? I have not seen many cases of us doing this. And I've tried to look for this. I've been actively looking for this for a very, very long time. Uh, over a year and a half now that I've been, you know, looking at articles and Twitter and blog posts and all that. And on a number of occasions, the last one was for this talk. It's like I've been searching for articles and all that. Can somebody give, I've, I found three cases. Can somebody give me something that I've missed? So it seems like in computer science, there's a bit more of that, you know, bug hunt and all that. But in psychology, unbelievably rare. I like this comment, um, you know, find a needle in a haystack. It's very difficult to find this kind of thing. So why is this happening in psychology? Since we're psychologists, we can contemplate our own psychology and think what are the factors that are contributing to this kind of, of very strange situation we're supposed to do science, but something else is going on. And I think it has to do with us being human and having all sorts of weaknesses. And of course, uh, we're driven sometimes by fear and social biases, which is why I want to share with you another case study. I think many of you are perhaps familiar with this, uh, but if you're in the environment or perhaps you don't know about the social psychology, honesty, morality kind of stuff. So if you want to know more about this, there's a video that explains this, but basically it's uh, this very prominent uh, paper. So I teach morality, I study morality, I uh, teach judgment decision making, I study judgment decision making. So for me, this is uh, one that appears in all the textbooks. It's been, you know, policy has been uh, conducted based on this. Uh, and it has very prominent researchers in morality and, and honesty. So you've got Francesca Gino and Dan Ariely. Max Bazemann is, is like a big name, wrote many books. And in 2012, they came out with this uh, very convincing uh, paper that has both uh, lab experiments and the field experiment that's showing that we find signing before rather than after the opportunity to cheat makes ethics salient. Uh, when they are needed most and significantly reduces dishonesty. So basically, let's say you fill a tax form or you fill a, you know, a report for the insurance company. Instead of asking them first to fill this and then sign at the end whether they reported this ethically, they said, please, first, you, know, you should put this at the beginning as a reminder that everybody is going to uh, do things ethically. And then uh, the, the report will be a lot more uh, ethical. And they showed a bunch of experiments uh, for this. And the most interesting experiment, which was done in the field, was this experiment number three, where they got some data from um, a car insurance company where people need to report how many uh, miles they're driving. And based on this, uh, they need to uh, pay uh, insurance. And then uh, basically they show that there was a reduction in uh, how much people um, you know, um, che cheated on reporting their uh, kilometers. Uh, so very interesting uh, thing. Now, so this, this was there for a while. There were some indicators that perhaps you know, this doesn't replicate very well. And at some point, uh, it seems like uh, Ashley and Ariela decided to uh, conduct a replication. But instead of doing this by themselves, they actually invited Max and Francesca and Dan Ariely and Lisa and Nina, uh, all to collaborate on this. They conducted a lot of uh, studies. And then finally, they came to the conclusion that their study doesn't replicate. And this is mind blowing. This is everything that I've been hoping for. So prominent senior le uh, leaders of the community uh, go and replicate their own paper. And then a number of times, and then conclude that they uh, were wrong 
So uh, I think in the, yes, I have this here. So the conclusion is it's a false positive finding. Therefore we conclude from these that there is no good evidence for the existence. So they rolled back on this and this was published in PNAS. I don't know if you've ever tried to get something into PNAS, but getting an application into PNAS seemed up until a year ago, uh, point to impossible. So perhaps you need this kind of group or a very prominent finding. Uh, my mind blown again. So uh, original authors conduct a replication of their own work and then come to the conclusion. So this is false positive, share everything, including uh, their data from 2012. They make everything public, uh, publicly available. I thought we're, you know, scientific utopia is coming. Everything is terrific. You know, finally open science is, is becoming mainstream. The senior authors, PNAS, everybody, is, is on board with this. And, and finally, we can just get back to doing science as it should be. So my conclusion from this was that we learned something, we updated our knowledge, we opened up. This is a win-win-win for everybody, both the original authors, PNAS and us. We updated our knowledge and now, uh, you know, this, this finding in PNAS, uh, and now, now we know that it doesn't replicate. It was a false uh, positive, right? Um, so this perhaps you've heard of, uh, Data Colada, uh, published uh, soon after the PNAS paper that the experiment number three uh, was based on fraud. So the, the data uh, was, was not real. And they did such an amazing job. Actually, they got this report from a different group that wanted to remain anonymous. So they combined forces together and had this very elaborate uh, description of everything that they've done in order to show that this is... Uh, there's, there's actually no, no way that this is real. Even the Excel sheet that came with different fonts and like the analysis is very, very uh, detailed and documented. There's, there's, no, there's no doubt anymore. It's very clear. Experiment three was a fraud. Question is who did this? It, data came from, allegedly came from the insurance company, you know, somebody in the insurance company, somebody from the, from the team, it's not really clear who did this, but the most important thing is that the original authors made their data public from 2012 when they published the replication. And based on that, two teams, the data Colada published this at the end, came to the conclusion based on a very detailed analysis looking at the data, that the data is not real. So something very important happened here. We don't really see that very often because we don't really share uh, very much. Now, the first author, Lisa, Lisa Shu, um, came out with this tweet, um, you know, I should be appalled. Instead, I'm delighted by this piece of investigative data journalism from the brilliant Data Colada team. And she goes on to detail why this is a big, a big win for, for science. And finally concluding that, uh, you know, I'm delighted that this story came to light and the scientific record is being corrected. Thank you from the, you know, they gave them credit and acknowledgement. And finally, at the end, not only, you know, there's a replication that shows false positive findings of the original, but the original was retracted. So we shared data, we opened up, we made everything publicly uh, available, and we came to the conclusion that one of the data sets was actually a fraud. Can you imagine what would happen if we just opened up everything that was ever published and we had some teams going over this again and again in order to see whether this is reliable or not? All of us have collaborators, we have students, senior authors, we have all sorts of people, insurance companies that we work with in order to get our data. Uh, we want to know whether this data is reliable uh, or not. And uh, very unfortunate that there's a retraction, even more unfortunate that there's fraud somewhere, somebody needs to investigate this. But as science, it's very important that everything is open because then we can check this, we can retract this. And then we can update our knowledge to this. So if we want to do policy from now on, maybe changing, you know, whether I sign at the beginning or the end, doesn't matter anymore. So now I know. So I don't need to, to waste time in order to change all the tax forms or the insurance company forms and all that. I can, I can put this into something else. So very important process in, in my view. So to me, this is all a big win for open science. This would be a celebration. Original authors did a replication, the replication failed and they published this and in PNAS, they shared all the materials, including from 2012. Some people went and checked this uh, and then uh, everybody accepted responsibility and congratulated this uh, sort of thing. 
Now, how does this relate to me, aside from me being very interested in open science, is that two weeks before this whole thing happened, something happened with our team. So what happened with our team two weeks prior to that? This publication came out recently, although it started two weeks before this whole thing, where Hiro, he is an early career researcher, together with uh, four of my students and a teaching assistant over here. So we had two teams of two students working on two replications of Heyman and Ariely 2004 independently, then peer reviewing one another. And then we had this whole process. I can talk about this later if we have time. But finally, they conducted this as part of my course, um, did a replication. We had two successful replications of uh, this finding. Then Hiro came in, took, uh, took the lead on this, co-authored with the, with the students. And finally, uh, we wanted to submit this. Now, what happened during that is that we needed to reproduce the materials. And we did an analysis of the effect sizes in the original. And based on that, we wanted to do a power analysis. And very fast, it became very clear that there's something very wrong uh, with the statistics in one of the studies in Heyman and Ariely. So uh, we um, said, you know, it's important to update first the original, something with the statistics doesn't work out to make sure that there's a correction. And then it's even more important based on that concern to show that we have two successful applications plus we were able to reframe a null effect into something that actually we found an effect where, where none was, was expected. So we did the obvious uh, thing over there and we sent this to psychological science saying, you know, this was published in psychological science. And now first we found uh, errors. Second, we have two successful applications with an updating of the framework and the phenomenon and exact, more exact accurate effect sizes. Um, please publish this but immediately we got a desk rejection from psychological science. And then I posted this on Twitter. You'll see a lot of Twitter posts because this is uh, you know, how we communicate stuff. So uh, the rejection, rejection letter is over here. Even though this is a classic manuscript, I did not move the needle. You know, There's a major concern about the manipulation of the original, not on ours, because we're just doing a, a replication and it doesn't further the literature empirically or theoretically, but you have errors. And we just did a replication in order to ensure that this really holds. So what do you mean by that? I was quite upset by this, but finally we took this decision later and we sent this to Collabra Psychology that uh, as you can see, uh, published this. Simin Vazir helped us with this as the editor to go through this uh, whole thing. And um, the interesting thing about this is that the editor, although she, she didn't want to uh, you know, move on with our manuscript, she took this to heart and she went to check with Dan Ariely and finally, because of what the students did and the rep reproduction and the replication, um, they issued an expression of concern. So you can see the editor of Psychological Science and Dan Ariely together issued an expression of concern. Uh, and then I started, even before I, I saw this data collector stuff, I started getting requests for you know, interviews and what is going on because two weeks ago, uh, this happened expression of concern and now there's this fraud case or is this related? Is this fraud as well? And I'm like, you're getting like the wrong thing from this whole thing, because this is a celebration of open science. We, we did a replication, we did a reproduction, we found errors, and then we, we, we made sure we validated that this thing really holds with a successful replication. And I really liked Retraction Watch over here saying, you know, the team of students uh, did this. It's amazing because up until the team of students found this in my class, nobody uh, really cared about this. And then, um, you know, I wrote, and I really believe in this, students and early career researchers are the key to the credibility revolution, and they are most underappreciated, underutilized stakeholder. And I like this uh, reply by Dan Ariely. This is the way that science should proceed. It really is. We should make this very, very common. This is how things should be. So why, why, why is this uh, a problem? First of all, this is 2021, and the paper was published in 2004. Now, if you look at the issue expression of concern, you'll see this table of uh, all the differences in p-values. Actually, anybody can check this with StatCheck. Actually, people have checked this in StatCheck in 2016 and publi published this on PubPeer. So if psychological science, instead of waiting for my students to find these things and uh, send them application, could have checked first by themselves going with StatCheck over everything that they've ever published, 
Second, it's just like checking pop here on everything that's been published on psychological science. Does any journal do, do this? There's so many things out there in pub beer. And now we know that there's uh, information, updated information about our knowledge, but nobody really does anything about that. That is really a shame. And more citations and more uh, TED Talks and more books published based on, on bad findings. So to me, once again, this should be a celebration of open science because an independent team, in this case us, uh, conducted a, a reproduction replication. We found some errors, but we also conducted a replication and made sure that this really holds. So this is a successful replication. So this is terrific. We communicated the error to the uh, target, both the journal and the corresponding author, Dan Ariely, uh, showed support for this and issued by themselves an expression of, of concern. And we were able to finally publish this replication in Collabora. Uh, psychology. Of course, I would have liked it if this was, it was together in uh, psychological science, uh, one next to the other. So uh, there's the original, the expression of concern, something on it, and then referring to the replication. But, you know, this is as best as uh, I, I could have expected, uh, given this whole thing. What was the community media reaction to this whole story? And why am I uh, sharing this uh, with you? It was, very, it was very hostile and personal. So immediately it's like, so who did the fraud? It has to be Dan Ariely because he's prominent. He has more to lose. Maybe we should start digging about everything in Dan Ariely's uh, past. Very negative. You know, I was, I was looking at the Twitter posting and just like, instead of us celebrating this as a win for, for open science and everything that's been done over here, you know, with the original authors finally taking responsibility and the journals doing all kinds of things and us finding errors and updating our knowledge, it was very sad for me to just look at the Twitter uh, feed and even people with the open science community, you know, talking about uh, all, all uh, things personal and nothing about the, the achievements here or the real takeaways that I think should be um, taken care of. So why, why, why do I care about community reactions? And I know that Twitter is a bubble and I know that this does not represent everybody, but I know the difference that happened between, you know, the PNAS replication paper was published. Finally, you know, I was giving talks and I was going in the corridor and people were stopping me. Did you see that a replication was published in PNAS by these prominent authors? And I'm like, yeah. So just imagine how wonderful it would be if you would share things. And then people started saying, yeah, maybe I should just start sharing everything that I have. And I thought, oh, this is utopia. Amazing. What happened after this whole thing with Dan Ariely and, and fraud came up? People are saying, did you hear what happened to Dan Ariely? I'm never going to share anything because I don't know what's in my data and my code. I don't know what my collaborators, my students, my data source, the insurance company, what they did. And a lot of early career researchers are like, I'm, I'm very embarrassed that, you know, people are going to find errors and mistakes. But if you think about this for a second, as a psychologist, we really need to take a step back and understand that this is a very, very strong bias, you know, a negativity bias. But this is the wrong conclusion to take from this. But rather than the fear, you know, the, the fight or flight is like, oh, we, we're not, we're not going to engage in this anymore and just burn, you know, put our, our head in the sand. Um, I think the conclusion for me is we have to react in a completely different way and that we have to open everything because we want the community. Just imagine in 20 years, Dan Ariely or anybody whose who's findings are, are not replicated or there's some errors or mistakes. Can you imagine 20 years after you've built a name for yourself, suddenly somebody finds it 20 years ago, you, you, know, you, had, you had an error and then I, all the TED Talks, all the books, everything that you've communicated, everything is wrong. I don't want this to happen to me. Nobody wants this to happen to them. So let's find this now. So for me, it's like, oh my God, I need to get everybody on board to find all the mistakes. I don't want to have to fear that there is something wrong in my data. And I work a lot with students. I don't know what these students are, are, are doing if they're you know, following the protocols. I do the best that I can. We have a lot of checks and balances within our team. Those working with us in the team know that you know we have two teams working separately and then they peer review one another and then I communicate everything on, on Twitter. And then we have an early career researcher come in. And then of course we make everything open science. And then we have the reviewers and the journals. But still, I, I, want, I want to know with the power of community that what I do, I've done my best in order to ensure that what I do is solid. Rather than saying I'm going to hide everything, my personal reaction was I have to expose everything. I want to invite others to help me make sure that everything 
is, is solid. I started doing this in 2019. At the beginning, I admit, I started doing reassessments and reproductions of, um, uh, you know, we had the many labs and the open science collaboration. So I took this as an exercise for the students. They have this template, you're welcome to take it and, and, and do this. So undergraduates can go and do reproduction just like Data Coletta did to uh, publish findings. So I took the easy ones, the ones that have open science. They wanted to check, did many labs two, did many labs one do a decent job? Can we learn something from this? Can the students learn something from that in their own replication projects? And then people ask me, great that you're doing this you know, on other people, but did you ever check yourself? And in 2020, I'm like, oh yeah, I should check myself. So right now, every year, the students check what we pre-printed or published the previous uh, year. They learn a lot from what the students are doing, but uh, also helping us make sure that things are solid. And um, I decided to post this on my uh, blog website. Please check me, replicate me. I want to know if I'm wrong and I will pay you if you find something. Uh, if you find a minor error, I'll pay you five US dollars. If it's a major error, it's I'll, I'll pay you 50 US dollars. I don't have a big budget, so this is coming out of my own pocket. Um, but uh, I, I prefer to pay this money now than in 20 years have to face all the backlash of my uh, mistake or perhaps a data that was fraudulent that I based my, my research on. And the amazing thing is that in the last semester, I told my students, not only do you need to do these uh, reports on our previous years, but if you find something, I'm going to pay you. And my, <laughs> to my great surprise, they found a lot of things. I had to pay a lot of money to my students. <laughs> and of course, this is great incentive for them. And it's also a lot of fun. You know, let's find mistakes in the professor's work. So rather than us being, you know, the ivory tower, we never make mistakes. Everything that we say is holy. Now the students understand that, you know, this is part of the process. This is who we are, scientists. And we update our knowledge and we make mistakes, especially if there's a collaboration, especially if we have cognitive resources that are limited and the bounded rationality in our limited capacity to deal with all of this. So I'm very, very grateful for this. And then I gave them the opportunity. Do you want me to just send it to you? Uh, or do you want me to uh, donate this to uh, give well effective altruism? So I'll match every dollar that you put in, I'll put in. And finally, we donated 250 US dollars to give well. So everybody won. Uh, I won because, you know, uh, now my papers are more solid. The team won. The students uh, um, had the good feeling of finding something, seeing that the professor can be wrong and then contributing to effective altruism. And then the world got something from this. I don't know how many mosquito nets uh, in Africa we financed by this, but uh, you know, everybody, everybody contributed something. I saw this on Twitter yesterday. I love this. I think everybody should do this. So somebody posted this on Twitter. Uh, in this lab, mistakes are expected, respected, inspected, and corrected. So I, I love this. I think all of us uh, should do this. How do I do this? So I adopted some stuff from the open science community in my own lab manual. And you can see that it's very important for me that every student reads this carefully. Everybody that joins the team can, can see a very long detailed Google doc of what it is that I believe in, but it is to, okay to make mistakes. It's part of the process. We're all human. Uh, we just need to facilitate a process that we can find these things. If you find a mistake, just you know, tell, admit this, we own our mistakes. And then, of course, we, we uh, work to, uh, to improve on them. Now, why, why is the, isn't this uh, happening? I, um, up until four years ago, was looking for a job. I did a postdoc in Maastricht University looking for a job. And I decided that I'm going to make my identity uh, open science. My talk of replication in open science was not received very positively. So here you have John reflecting on uh, Twitter. I was not moved. Uh, on in the job interviews after Skype interview because I was I mentioned open science and then I, I was told that it spooked some of the search committee members. They thought I would join the department and start trying to replicate everybody's work. <laughs> so this is very, very common. Uh, he finally stopped mentioning it in interviews. I kept mentioning this because to me, this was a very good sign that this is a department that I don't want to join. I want to join a department that would, you know, this kind of thing. Finally, University of Hong Kong embraced this, let me do all sorts of remarkable things with the students at HKU. So I came back all the way from the Netherlands to, uh, to Hong Kong to join a place that allowed me to pursue this kind of 
of direction. My view on this is that we need these kinds of people in our departments. We want to have them as our colleagues. We want to have this kind of service. I see what I provide, what the students are doing as a service to others. I'm not going to force anybody you know, into, into doing something that they don't want to do. But I think it's an important contribution that we don't really appreciate right now in, in science. How long do I have? Okay, uh, getting there. Uh, some clarifications, credits, and stuff about this whole uh, idea. I hope that this was uh, clear enough how I came to do all of that. Uh, I just want to, to be a little bit more humble about what it, did, it is that happened uh, in, in my work. It's not only that students find mistakes in what I do, but even with all the checks and balances. So, for example, our replication of Heyman and Ariely, where we find errors in their original article, when we submitted this after 12 people in our team, and of course the students, and of course the open science community and Twitter, everybody went through all of that. Samin Vazir went through this, spent a, a few hours and found mistakes. And she communicated this to us. And because Collabor Psychology shares everything, including the peer review history, you can see Samin's the decision letter and our reply about her finding mistakes. So even after we've done everything that we could to find mistakes, we still made mistakes. So what uh, Simin uh, suggested and we embraced is that please use the red team concept. Have somebody that is not involved in this team go through everything, you know, the, the code, the data, the, the copy paste from the, the code and the data into the manuscript, uh, working on all the interpretations. And then we recruited from our, our team, uh, Max, and Max did an amazing report, a red team uh, report. So he attacked our project in every possible uh, way. Even more mistakes, even after Simin Vazir gave us that, we were able to, and now I'm sure there's still some other mistakes in our team and some of the stuff that we've done, but I'm a lot more confident because of this amazing process. But we need these red teams. We need people like Max. We need editors that care about this, that ask, ask for these kinds of things in order to make this kind of uh, difference. Where did this check me, replicate me thing start? Uh, it came from Stuart Ritchie, actually. I owe him the credit for this. So if you haven't read science uh, fictions, you really should, because it tells the tale of open science and how this came to be. So he's the, the one who replicated BIM 2011. To me, this is how psychological science got started with uh, replication crisis. So he was one of the first that got this thing going. And finally, he published a paper, uh, a paper and a book about this whole story. And because he wanted to make sure that if he's talking about other people not being uh, replicated, and having errors and mistakes, he wanted to make sure that he is, you know, up to the standards. So uh, in his uh, website, he has a correction page where he's willing to pay you for finding errors in his book. So when I read this, I thought this is wonderful. I have I have to adopt this. This is the closest that I've seen to what it is that I want to do. And more recently, uh, you know, we, we have uh, Nicholas and, and Leo. Uh, Lackens blogged about this and then they offered the red team challenge uh, and I think we need to have a lot more of that I don't know why it's so rare I don't know why it's so difficult to convince funders that we need this we really need to stop this beforehand not 20 years later after we've you know, communicated this to all possible audiences after I published uh, after I posted on Twitter that I'm looking for other examples. I saw this wonderful uh, example. So go and check this out. Uh, this is perhaps the most elaborate that I've seen, lacking robustness, 20 euros, if you find some stuff in his uh, research. And somebody also showed me that uh, if you find uh, some paranormal claims uh, to be, um, you know, um, have errors, then you'll get some funding from this J James Randi Education Foundation. I like this uh, summary by PLOS Biology published, I think, a month or two ago. Rather than being disappointing footnote, error checking should be supported and funded by government agencies and research institutions. Yeah. So uh, I don't think uh, Elizabeth Bick needs to be introduced, but she does amazing stuff at detecting uh, fraud in um, uh, images. And then James Heathers, you know, the, the so-called data thug, um, wonderful things in, in this team coming up with this uh, commentary uh, perspective. So uh, let's, let's uh, follow on this.
I don't know if I have some time. Yeah, like three, five minutes. So let's uh, uh, talk a little bit about our team. Um, what, what are we doing in our team? So 2016, when I was in Maastricht University, I learned of, I was like one hour away from Lackens, a couple of hours away from Tilburg and this, the Dietrich Stapel uh, uh, traumatized group uh, talking about uh, open science and all that. So the, for the first time I got to know what, what is happening in the field. And I sat down with myself and I decided this is what I want my research to look like. Trustworthiness, uh, reproducibility and replicability. This is the most important thing for me. Sharing everything, I think, taking for granted, but also failures. We don't really talk about failures. Sharing the entire process and really focusing on collaboration and community, not just me by myself, but I really want to open up and work with uh, anybody who's willing to work with me around the world, uh, especially Austria. So uh, the more that we work together, the more that we do stuff, uh, the more that we're able to get closer to the truth. This is our team. You can see also some representation from, from Austria. Right now it's like 78 early career researchers, either lead authors or peer reviewers, um, 36 guided thesis students and uh, about 370 students that went through my courses and did replications and extensions, did the assessments. Um, there's a whole process, I won't go through this, but the students work you know, throughout the semester in my course, they do all sorts of things. And after they uh, have at the end over here, APA submission style uh, manuscript that's ready to be submitted. We don't submit this, but we invite you. So if you're an early career researcher and you want to join us, we've done everything. We just want you to come join us. Help us to verify that this is solid. Help us do more analysis. Help us make sure that the introduction and the discussion are appropriate. And then to go through the entire uh, process uh, with the journals. And then you get, you get lead author, followed by the students with shared co-authorship, then the teaching assistants, and then me at the end. Uh, this is what we're doing right now. In the last year, we've moved everything to register report stage one. Uh, so um, same thing, just without the data collection. You can also come in and lead this. How many did we do? In four years, we've done uh, about 120 of these. So ADR completed with data collection, everything written up, 40 are registered reports. Uh, and this is starting to have a real impact. So in the past year, as you can see over here, everybody who's underlined are students in my classes. These are undergraduates, which is remarkable. So undergraduates uh, from the course get to uh, publish their work in replications. And we started submitting this a lot to journals, uh, together with early career researchers. So everybody here who's first author is, is an early career researcher who joined us. And we were able to get this into some, some good journals and the team together seems to have quite the impact. Um, this time right now, I am completely overwhelmed by, with work because we're doing something like 16 different uh, peer community and register reports. So all the thesis students working with me are submitting as registered uh, reports. Um, just want to give one last example which, before I wrap up uh, of a good example of a senior scholar that has responded well to our teams. We've done 120 of these, but most of the reactions I got from original authors uh, was uh, um, not very good, especially at the beginning. Now I think uh, we're getting uh, more and more positive responses, but I, I really like uh, this one over here. Uh, this is how I post things on Twitter. So I post everything as an open peer review. So for example, here, Francesca Gino, uh, Dan Moore, and Max Bazerman had an unpublished manuscript with over 100 citations that we decided to do our application on. And then uh, Dan Moore uh, responded, say, I'm honored that you thought that our study uh, you know, is interesting enough to be worth replicating, but I'm not really sure that this is uh, worthwhile. And then I responded to this. But then finally, when we finished the project and we had the findings and we summarized everything, it's wonderful that Don Moore actually uh, publicly said, it's great that they completed the replication. Please go and check with their findings to update your knowledge about this. And to my great surprise, he's been starting to do uh, a lot of replications and even getting this published in PNAS. So wonderful change in uh, senior author. So things are definitely changing. We're doing a lot of peer community and registered reports, working together with Chris Chambers and their amazing team. So that's wonderful. To sum things up, uh, we have this uh, enthusiastic team of early career researchers and students that are doing uh, wonderful things. So if you want to know more about what we're doing and you want to join us, 
This is the link. It's very detailed Google Docs, so please go and check that out. You can take lead uh, over a replicated, uh, completed replication or, or on a registered report stage one, or you can collaborate with us on anything. Or you can even join some of the assessments that we're doing. Everything that I talked about right now is summarized on this page. This is our mass replication summarizing the 100, 120 uh, replications that we've done so far. Everybody in our team, all the resources that we have and uh, information about both open science and meta science, very detailed. So you can scan this or follow the link and have a look. Uh, if you want to know more about me, that's on my uh, website. Uh, as you've seen, I'm very active on Twitter, so uh, that's a good way to contact me. Uh, I'm very eager to communicate, help others in their journeys and share as much as possible. We have a mailing list, so there's a few talks coming up in, in Norway. There's hopefully some coming up in South Central America afterwards, but um, uh, we have updates about all the preprints, all the talks, all the meetings that, that we're doing, so you can take a part of that. Uh, in that if you'd like. And if you um, are not sure about something and you need some help, uh, we have a very eager team that's uh, enthusiastic about open science and we want to hear from you. So um, let us know how we can help you with your open science, your meta science uh, research. This is my email if you want things to be a bit more private. So this is the way to contact me. So that's it for me for now. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your talk, Gillette. Um, at least for me, there's really been some enlightening information and a lot of, uh, well, food for thought. Um, and I'd suggest to now give the audience the opportunity to ask questions or raise comments in the next couple of minutes. Um, yeah, thanks very much for your talk, Gillette. I've got a range of questions, but I'll ask one first question because I always thought in science, I mean, one way we go forward and we might understand the strength of evidence better and so on. One major way we do this is via systematic reviews, meta-analyses and so on. So how important is it to replicate the actual primary work? Because my assumption is that there's a phenomenon or a finding and you do various approaches, different types of studies on it, and then you summarize it via meta-analysis or something. So what's the complementarity or the, the importance of the approach you're suggesting, if that makes sense? You mean that you're not sure about the value of replications, if I understand correctly, as a supplement to what we're already doing with systematic reviews and meta-analyses? Yeah, I, that, the way you've just phrased it sounds quite critical. I'm not even being critical. I was just, that's, that was my model of, of research moving forward. So I'm just wondering, what's your view? How do the two fit together? Or maybe they don't. No, they definitely fit together. I think uh, all of these are needed. If anything, the meta-analysis uh, now, in the last decade, we've developed some uh, methods for uh, looking at publication bias and all sorts of other things in order to understand that actually we've been publishing only positive findings and in, very, in various things. So I give the examples in my meta-analysis workshops on uh, money priming and power posing and uh, ego depletion, I think, was uh, one of the famous cases in, in social psychology, where because of these publication bias adjustments that came out in 2015, only because of those, Hager, for example, in ego depletion decided, Hager was the one who published the meta-analysis in 2010, but ego depletion showing a coherence D of 0.62, which is stronger than a medium effect in psychology. And suddenly it came out 2014, 2015, some publication bias adjustments to uh, meta-analysis, looking at all sorts of things. You can even see this in a funnel plot, seeing the publication bias. And then they decided maybe we need a mass collaboration, uh, a replication register report without all the bias. So this is going to be published regardless of what the outcome is. And experts in ego depletion from around the world came together in order to get this, uh, you know, there's the University of Toronto, uh, Michael Inslet, as a person who's, who's been publishing on this for a decade, sure, positive that ego depletion is going to, uh, you know, have, have remarkable success, but then finally finding very um, um, small effects. And then the original authors, you know, Kathleen Voss and Roy Baumaster pushed back on this and then decided, they decided to do their own. So instead of 24, 23 labs, they did 40 labs from around the world. So they invested even further into this only to find a very similar weak effect 
that we conclude Michael Inslee and a bunch of others that, you know, he's not in support of this. So everything started from a meta-analysis, but even meta-analyses are not perfect. You know, I was mentioning the, the Lacken's team. Uh, one of the remarkable things that they've done, it's a, a wonderful preprint that I refer to a lot, is that they took published uh, meta-analysis in the literature. I don't understand why meta-analysis do not share the data, given that it's, you know, it's coding of what is already in the literature. But meta-analysis do not share how they've coded things. And they just coded the same things again. So they took what the meta-analysis did. Of only 50%, of course, uh, shared anything about you know, the effects that they've coded. But in the 50%, they wanted to see whether they've coded this correctly. And they got to a point where 50% of the 50% got the effects wrong, coded incorrectly, and sometimes went in the opposite direction, completely reversing. So everything that holds in the reproduction of experiments, uh, correlational studies, data archives, and all that definitely holds for uh, our meta analyses. And we need to improve all of these. I think the conclusion, I like this uh, hierarchy of evidence that Chris Chambers has with registered reports. I think at the end is a lot of registered reports, a lot of replications, and finally a meta-analysis, hopefully also registered reports, a registered report meta-analysis summarizing all the re uh, registered reports, uh, which given the very large literature that we have, we need to revisit things, a very large body of uh, replication register reports. So we need to go and revisit uh, things because even things that we thought were really solid, we have meta-analysis showing a coins D of 0.62. Now we can run some advanced analysis on this that might indicate that there are some problems and that we need a replication, but with that, First, having access to everything, and if access is not available, then creating something that would allow us to investigate this, and then repeating this again in order to see whether this holds or not. And then forget about whether this holds or not. You know, it's been a very long time. We do replications of classics in the 1970s. Since the 1970s, based on a sample of 30 people in Princeton, We've been writing books and doing TED Talks that are saying this is how things are. Nobody is revisiting this. Um, so once there was a meta-analysis on a few studies, underpowered studies back in the 1970s, replication should be inherent in what it is that we do because we need to update our knowledge. We need to first uh, uh, see, show that what we've actually done replicates independently in other places, in other labs uh, around the world. Plus, we need to update our knowledge, so we need to revisit them. We can't just keep referring to a meta-analysis published in the 1980s to assume that this is 40 years later still relevant. So we need all of that. We need meta-analysis, we need replications, we need, of course, novel or empirical research, and we need error checking uh, in order to bring this all together to update our knowledge and make sure that we're doing uh, solid science. Um, so my question is, I recently stumbled across a project called Replication Markets. You probably know about it. And um, I will just explain it so we're all on the same page. So it's a project by DARPA, and they um, they assess like 3,000 3, different research claims and check whether they will, or they make predictions about whether they will replicate or not. And I think everyone can um, also join the predictions. And then they will test 5% of the research claims. And um, yeah, basically my question is, whether you think that projects like these will also play a role in the future and how promising they are. Yeah, so we, we've been actually been doing this. Um, so working together with the economists in Sweden, I think uh, she's, very, she's very active. Um, uh, we've been actually doing replication prediction markets uh, on our uh, JDM. Uh, findings. Uh, we haven't done this for the whole 120, but we've asked people to bet some money. Uh, I think the economist gave them something up to 50 US dollars on uh, predictions uh, uh, done accurately in order to see whether the intuitions that people have uh, are aligned with our replication uh, results. I think their findings, which they publish in a number of uh, places, really shows that people have some kind of an intuition. And I'm not just talking about scientists, I'm talking like even laypersons of what seems to um, be more solid um, than others. And the question is, how is this done? And they also uh, try to train an AI machine learning in order to uh, compare this to humans and intuitions. And then they try to see what to do about this. But DARPA score 
is definitely the most comprehensive attempt to replicate randomly assigned. So we, we don't do stuff that's uh, random. Uh, I choose the classics based on my own uh, preferences, uh, things that I think uh, you know, are impactful, uh, can have simplified design that I can do with students uh, during one semester and I can run online with Amazon and Mechanical Turk on Qualtrics. But DARPA score did the uh, random sampling from the literature, not just in psychology, but also in others, and together with the replicates, um, try to, to get an understanding. And I can, I can see why DARPA score would care about this. Like you want to know, uh, without having to do replications of everything in the literature, you want to know which ones are more likely so that you can apply this kind of prediction on what's already out there. So I'm really hoping, I'm, I'm eager to see what's going to come out from DARPA score. Um, we'll add this to what it is that we're doing, what the economists are doing in, in economics, uh, with some of their other samples and together hopefully we'll get a very accurate uh, not very but close to enough accurate um, to uh, understand what seems to be more replicable than others and then we can prioritize our resources to see what we want to focus on uh, and let's say if we determine policy then we can perhaps embed this within our decision making on, on what it is that we want to uh, to use but very important projects, uh, prediction markets are um, taking open science and replication and taking this to a meta science level. So I, I've been doing more and more of that and there's some other directions. But if you're interested in this sort of thing that we've been, that we've been exploring in our team, so we can talk more about that you know, uh, offsite. Oh yeah, I see something. The main, main issue with replication is the lack of funding. The original research has higher value yeah, in the eye of the, of the funder. I, completely understand this is my big pain <laughs> you've touched a, a very sensitive point i've been i've been applying for research funding for four years and i have not received any funding which is remarkable that we've been able to do 120 replications <laughs> with no funding it's just it's ridiculous so how how am i able to do this who is funding me at the beginning i got some seed money from the university so when i joined they gave me some money and we've been running on this and that's why I'm doing everything on online um, labor markets like uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, the only ones who are funding me so far are the teaching folks. They really like what I'm doing with students. So they're saying, oh, students are publishing, uh, students are doing real research. So that's terrific uh, uh, teaching related aspects. So I'm taking everything that the teaching is giving me and I'm putting this into the data collection. So I've solved this temporarily for me and my team but I can't, how many, I've got like so many rejections, especially from Hong Kong grant authorities. Very difficult. I completely understand this. And I think this is a big problem. My uh, funders, funders should change, should change this. Uh, I don't have a, a good solution for you. It really pains me to see psychological science accelerator. One of the most important projects that we've had in psychology since since forever, you know, so the psychological science, et cetera, that can get funding. I can't wrap my head around this. It's just, just remarkable. Uh, Center of Open Science, you know, has been better at recruiting because they have this open science framework infrastructure, but still so difficult, so painful. This has to change because uh, science is unsustainable uh, uh, without this, but things are changing. So for example, if we're talking about the Netherlands, the Netherlands are putting some big money behind this. Uh, I've, I've seen the Scandinavians uh, do some stuff. The UK uh, with the UK RI or something like that is putting some more money into it. Hopefully Austria, I don't know, you tell me. Uh, hopefully things will, will make a change. And I think also we don't have to have specific projects only for replications. I think we can have a bundle where we first do some innovative thing and then we replicate it in, in, to making sure that everything is uh, replicable. Plus my solution and my approach to everything right now in novel research, I do novel research. I do novel research through replication and extension. First, I build on the foundations of what is in the literature, trying to do things as a direct replication. And then I take the next step with an extension on top of that. Then I both contribute to replications and I contribute to novel findings. And this is a much easier bundle to sell to funders and my department and everybody who is who is involved, journals, uh, reviewers, and so forth. So there are some solutions to this. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I just have a quick question about the project that you did with your students when um, you asked them to look through your papers. Um, because you said, oh, you had a list um, and I was too slow to read it properly um, with like big errors or minor errors. Um, could you give us some examples of what a minor error and a medium or big error would be? Yeah, so a major error is an error that changes the conclusions of the paper. Um, so if a reanalysis or a code a mistake or whatever changes what it is that we found on how we framed this, found support, did not find support, something that is critical to uh, the paper that changes what it is that we've done, that's a major uh, issue. And we were, they were able to find one, one of those, uh, luckily in a paper that was in revise and resubmit. And we communicated this um, and, and changed this uh, in, in time. Um, a uh, minor error is anything, could be anything, um, but uh, si ra rather simple things. So, uh, you know, anything that, that doesn't change the, the conclusions of the paper uh, for that. Plus, I want to say that every error that I find um, in published research, if it's a preprint or something that is still revising, we just, we, we amend this. But uh, some of the mistakes or uh, reservations uh, that people had regarding my published research is on that web page. So not only am I uh, offering money, but I'm also communicating and uh, trying to set the, the record straight about what it is that I know about, about these uh, findings. Mm -hmm. Yes, so my question uh, was going in the same direction, but maybe I, I just want to push a little bit on this, uh, what is an error? Uh, in the sense that something could uh, technically change the conclusion of your paper in the sense that it pushes your p-value, I don't know, you, you said the wrong degrees of freedom, now it pushes your from significant to not significant, it was 0 0.049 and now it's 0 0.051. Um, so technically that would be, I guess, a, a major error. But on the other hand, you could have something that you could argue is not an error. Let's say I fit a different model, a mixture model, and I cut, I don't know, residual variance by half. I, I can do much better prediction than you could with your model, but it's on the same side of significance, let's say. And so in one sense, you have an error that changes the conclusion of your paper. On the other hand, you have an error that doesn't change, but would make your paper much better. How do you kind of arbitrate these kind of situations? And, you know, um, because uh, how consequential something is and how unambiguous an error it is can be orthogonal to the one to the other. So this is my question, you know, whether it's important that it's unambiguous in error, or is it important how much of a kind of real practical consequence it has? And then the, the second kind of twist to that is, you know, how sustainable or scalable do you think this? I, I respect very much when people put, you know, their money where their mouth is, but how, how scalable that is to whole of science or whole of psychological research, at least in the sense that, um, so if an error happens in a paper that no one's reading or citing, did the error really happen? <laughs> does, that, does that, for example, matter? You know, you could have people spending their time, you know, looking for errors in papers that just don't matter because no one cites them, no one's reason, they have no consequences. If you go to this older literature that you were talking about in the 70s, you will sometimes see, you know, stuff that just evaporated from the literature because it didn't, it probably didn't replicate and people stopped citing it and stopped stop being fashionable. So these are my two questions. You know, how do you kind of think about it? Uh, how scalable this is and how important it is that something is unambiguous in an error and how important it is, how consequential it is, practically speaking. Wow, oh, I, I love this. Good question. It's, don't, don't you think that we as a scientific community should discuss this and have some very clear guidelines on this? It's like, why should somebody like me and nobody uh, have something, you know, why should I invent this for myself? Shouldn't we be talking about this as a scientific community and reaching some standards that we can live by? Shouldn't we be discussing this as a community about how we want to keep our records straight? Even the question of what is a replication, what is a direct replication, what is the value of replication? I can't believe that we're still like debating these kinds of things given everything that's been happening in the last 10 years. Some of the reviews that I get, uh, rejection letters that I get, it's like I'm, I'm still surprised that some of these things, it's, it's, it's a reflection of us that people like me need to answer questions like that. You would have, you know, when I came into a PhD, I really thought science has everything figured out. I can just come in and do my thing. I never did I imagine that it's going to be up to me to, to define standards, to have templates, to figure these, these things out. And I have to say, 
I'm, I lack all the skills in order to do this well. Uh, definitely me on my own. I'm, I'm almost everything, even my students, when they ask me stuff about how to calculate effect sizes, I admit, I, I don't know all, the, all these things. So I go on Twitter and I say, can somebody please help me figure out? My student asked me, I have no clue. For me, this is a community effort in our team. We have people who are much better at, let's say, mixed models or regression models or you know, time series. And then some people who are better at experimental and then we reach out to them. Uh, Meta-analysis, you know, I do what I can, but I reach out to, to experts in that. Also here, I think, what is an error? I think we should talk about this. So what did I do? I adopted uh, some of what others, uh, Dan like Stuart uh, Ritchie. I apply my own intuitions. Uh, I think it's like a, a fun exercise when it's with students, but when it comes right down to the consequences of this for the scientific literature, we should get everybody on top of this. You know, this is a fundamental question of the philosophy of science is like, what is an error? How do we deal with errors? How do we communicate this? How do we value this? What is the money that needs to be put behind each and every one of these errors? If DARPA score is doing this for replications, I think we really need to uh, look at this in how do we incentivize this? How much is this worth to us? Um, who needs to take responsibility for this? What is the right process? Not people like me, you know, I have certain things that I've built over the last four years. I think I know a thing or two about replications and how to do this with judgment decision-making. But, you know, now I'm dealing with things that are far beyond my, my capacity, my understanding, my training. I really don't know. So I think in, in, the, in the questions of what is an error, how do we define an error, uh, what constitutes a serious major error or not, I don't really have answers aside from... Right now, I'm using my own intuition, and I think it's super important that we deal with this as a community and talk about this. How come nobody's talking about this? You know, up till the Lacken's team uh, with uh, Nicholas and, 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 and you know, uh, incentivizing red teams, I, I've, I've not seen much about this. If anything, the data thugs of uh, uh, Nick Brown and, and James Heathers are, are not being incentivized. Elizabeth Bick up until uh, long ago did not even have funding as I support her on Patreon. She doesn't have an, an academic salary. So we, 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 need to, we need to define this better. I completely agree with you. How scalable is this? It has to be scalable because otherwise we don't have a science. I don't really understand how we can treat ourselves as serious scientists and communicate anything to our students, to practitioners, to policymakers. You know, if we're talking about environmental psychology, we're facing some of the big, biggest challenges we've ever seen with climate change and global warming. How can we communicate everything if we don't even know how to assess our errors and how to conceptualize them, define them, uh, put value money behind them? We should really check ourselves here and make sure that we have uh, answers uh, for this. I think there are some already, we've, we've played a little bit the last three years, we've played a little bit with some models that I think give us some indications of where to go. I think there are some models that we can adopt from computer science, uh, perhaps about how they do bug, uh, bounty and hunting and attacking and, and all of that. Uh, but this has to be an inherent part of our psychological science process. I wish I had more answers to give you on this, but I, I wanna learn from you, from the others in the community about what you think about this. If I see a way to improve the way that I'm doing this other than following my intuition on what, what does it mean, changing the conclusions of a paper, I would be very happy uh, to do all that. I just want to say one, it's like a side note, but I think it's also important to uh, think about how do we conclude whether we have evidence for something or not. So you, you made a, a bit of a, a cynical joke about this, which I think is really important about what is the p-value what does it say to us? What is an effect size? What is a meaningful effect size? What is the smallest uh, effect size of, of interest to us? We don't even discuss these things. Only recently in the last year or two from the open science community, I see some papers dealing with these, the meta science uh, community, some Melbourne and uh, um, Matrix and in Stanford, all that are making some progress in this. But this is the fundamentals of what it is that we're doing. We haven't really figured things out and people still follow the p-value equals 0.05. And that is just not, not sustainable. We have, to, we have to deal with this. So we need to have more debates and more questions about what it is that we're doing. And we can start from how do we uh, establish evidence? How do we know if we've done a mistake? How do we know when we need to change our conclusions? How do we know, for example, if something doesn't replicate, 
who should we follow, the replication or the original? At what point do we start, start looking at ego depletion power? How much more money do we need to put into these uh, things that we can't replicate until we can say finally, you know, uh, we, we need to put this uh, aside. Good questions. I wish I had some answers for that. I think it's up for the community for us together to, to deal with these questions. Okay, thank you very much for, for the answer. And um, I, I just want to say, I put the link to this um, work from Robin Hansen. I think you mentioned uh, this work from Anna Dreber uh, about the um, prediction markets. And I think this is where it comes from. And I can also put a link there's from the fifties already people were asking this question, how do you reward people for their predictions? And maybe this would be another model of not paying for errors, but rather people taking their predictions. And this is where, uh, and how can you then kind of justly pay for that? That might be also interesting to you. So I, I would put that. And I, I participated in one of these prediction markets and I made some money on that. And actually, uh, if you are curious about how people figure it out, because I, I'm not by, my by background a psychologist, I just read the abstract and I thought to myself, does this sound like BS? And when the answer is yes, it doesn't replicate. <laughs> so that's the whole heuristic that is needed to win money on that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you for the answer and for the very Gosh, so how, how can you imagine like all the reviewers and the editors and the community and the TED Talks and the books and the media who have been, you were able to spot the BS in you know a five second read of the abstract but we've been communicating this to audiences for a long time convincing ourselves so you have perhaps a skill that um, many in the scientific process don't really have uh, we we need we need that skill we need to quantify it so that we know what it is that you did in those five seconds going over the the abstract i wish i wish i had this because in my phd i read all these things and I really thought that these things were solid replica. For me, there was no, no question that ego depletion is, is, a strong, is a strong effect that replicates uh, well. You know, imagine, imagine the shock. I was not able to read an abstract and see that this is not uh, replicable. Um, but now I think I've kind of fine-tuned my skills, but I would like to know what this process is. Very, very interesting. I, I, I love that you shared that. Thank you. Um, so it's more of a comment or an idea um, since, uh, first of all, thank you for holding this talk. Um, it was 50 minutes, but it felt like five to me. And also I am so feel sorry for my supervisor now because instead of bringing just the most important questions to him, I will bring all my list of uncertainties to him now. <laughs> so that's that. Um, so um, your um, example of this one professor that reacted with, I am honored um, um, of uh, getting this reputation, um, brought me to this idea that um, we can we, we might be able to utilize replications as um, um, as a credential sort of so as a credential of impact because since replications are a lot of effort and um, take a lot of time we can only use it for the most relevant important impactful um, studies and then, um, we can, I mean, we have so much criticism around the impact factor, but a impact factor generated by the replications that your work receives would tell you so much about your work. And so would be really exciting, I think. <laughs> so um, I think it could really help the branding also, because I think replication studies from what you told us, it sounds like they lead a lot of branding. And that would be maybe like an angle or something that could make it work. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, good. No, I think we, we, especially as psychologists, we're supposed to know something about human nature. So we should know what motivates people and how to change culture. I really like this model by the Center of Open Science, you know, make it easy, make it possible, make it easy, make it rewarding, and then finally make it mandatory. Uh, I would have liked us to reach the make it mandatory uh, and then find ways for us to really ensure that everything is okay. But now we're dealing with, there is a status quo. We need to change things. Uh, senior authors uh, and the system, the journal, the publishers, definitely. Uh, and our universities are pushing back on this. And the question is, how do we, how do we motivate this? And until now, it seems like, you know, you have the Brian Osex and, uh, and such that have transitioned, changed their, you know, their religion 
into something else. But all of open science to me is a, a grassroots movement coming from bottom up uh, and driving, driving the change. And we're using whatever power we have in order to change things. For example, I was part of the pro initiative where uh, who is, who is reviewing papers for the journals? It is the early career researchers. So refusing as early career researchers to do any reviews for journals that don't share the data and the code. So I, st I started saying no to any request for review that didn't have this. And finally, together as a community, early career researchers use their very minimal power in order to drive a change. Uh, we can wait for systematic uh, changes, hopefully, you know, something that would involve the journals and the impact factors and the university and money. I really hope that's coming. Uh, I, I hope that people like uh, the Center of Open Science, Bionosic and the seniors will drive things from, from the top. I can see some changes happening definitely in the Netherlands and the UK um, and, and some of the other places. But I, I try and focus on what it is that I, I can uh, do on this. And I think there's, there's quite a bit that we um, that, that we can do. And uh, we can say no to things. We can uh, insist on all sorts of things where, that we actually have a lot more power than I think we, we know we have. We can drive a real change. I don't want to force anybody to do anything. So right now, the way that I'm framing things for a lot of people is that I offer services and I'm, I'm inviting them to, to make use of this uh, service. I would have liked them to be able to uh, sponsor me, fund me, and give me give me some support, but I, I will I will do this regardless. Um, if more, hopefully more, like uh, Don Moore uh, will embrace this and see the value in this, and that would be uh, terrific. But I'm not going to wait for them. I think all of us early career researchers, we need to uh, decide what it is that we're going to do in our future. We're going to be around here in you know 10, 20 uh, years. Uh, we need to think what legacy we're going to give the the next uh, generation. But I really think if you have a good idea, and this sounds like a, 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 cute, a cute idea that can make a, a difference, uh, let's, let's try and promote this. There's SIPs coming up uh, very soon, hopefully either remotely or in person. You'll take the Society for Improvement of Psychological Science. Twitter is very active. If you're still not there, uh, he, if you're hearing this talk and you're still not on Twitter, please jo join us over there. Post this, tag me, I'll retweet this. Let's like start something uh, happening uh, in order to try and, and, and drive uh, a change. Uh, students, early career researchers, us here, it's like, it's up to us to try and, and drive uh, this change with or without the senior scholars, with or without the big publishers, with or without the universities and the funding authorities. And we've been, we've been doing quite a lot the last five, 10 years. So I'm now at least in psychology, social psychology, I'm more optimistic than ever. There's a lot of things to work on. I would have liked things to be more solid now, but um, it's much better than what it was 10 years ago when I was doing my PhD. So things are moving in the right direction. Perhaps in five, 10 years, when everybody here finishes their PhD and becomes a tenure track or tenure professor, then we'll have a completely different science. I'm trying to think about this in a very optimistic, positive way. Uh, and just, just to answer the, the quick question on everything that I shared is for you to use as you wish. Uh, all the slides, later there'll be a recording, use this as, as you want. I'll stay here for as long as people wanna talk. Perfect, then I would um, now end the um, recording as well and um, make you host. And I mean, obviously we could, or all of us could continue this discussion um, much longer and it just highlights again, the importance of talking about this. Um, also, I've seen um, some things in the chat that there is a request for like establishing such a network in Austria. So I really hope that this talk can be kind of a starting point for um, something like this. And yeah, um, thank you so much for um, being here today, Gilad. Um, it's been a super interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. And I also really enjoyed the discussion. And um, thanks everybody for, for joining, um, for the interesting questions and comments. And yeah, everybody who is um, interested in discussing more and still has some time left um, can um, stay here. All right. Perfect. Thank um, you very much. Hope to see you in Austria in person one day soon. Yeah, hope so as well.